Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we're, we're calling it a tour, right? I mean, you're technically on tour. Yeah. Yeah. But you're going to make a little pit stop um, for a free concert, right? Can you tell us about this big announcement? Yeah, we're going to make a stop in uh, Mayfield, Kentucky on May 20th. Um, we're going to do a free show there at the high school football stadium. Mm. Um, we've partnered up with my friends at Coyote Tractors, and they're sponsoring all of it. And we just want to stop in Mayfield and and do a show and just mm -hmm. give those people a pat on the back mm -hmm. yeah. for, for what they've done. people who forget, why, why Mayfield? Uh, because December 10th, 2021, an incredibly strong tornado mm -hmm. came through the middle of downtown and just mm -hmm. destroyed, uh, you know, all of those historic buildings downtown. Most of those buildings were over 100 years old. Mm. I mean, it was just tragic. And, you know, I think 24 people, that tornado, I think, actually killed over 80 people. But right there in Mayfield, it was 24 people that got killed when that tornado came through. It was just, a, it was a tragedy. And um, we were looking for a place to, to do a video for this song on our new album called Somewhere in America. And it, the song just talks about, you know, somewhere in America, there are still people that have that an indomitable spirit and they yeah, just you know resilience. yes that yeah. resiliency and and we could think of no place better uh, you know that exemplified that than Mayfield Kentucky yeah, and so now I've spoken with the mayor Onan and uh, she's been wonderful to work with and so we're gonna go to Mayfield and That's great. give them a pat on the back. And, yeah. and the thing about that song it, you know it talks about kindness and it talks about what we do in America when when uh, other citizens are hurting and, and how we come together. How do people find out more about the concert? Uh, go to traceagons.com slash Mayfield and everything you want to know will be yeah, right there. So and once good. again, I'd like to say thanks to my friends at Coyote Tractors for stepping up to the plate and um, mm, making, this making this happen. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to it. And, and the people that I've spoke to from Mayfield have just all been just beautiful mm -hmm. people. So the cat's out of the bag. They, yeah. they're, they're in on the secret. Well, they, they knew. They, they tried to keep it a secret, <laughs> yeah. but I think they told some That's people. Great. But anyway, there are so many towns across the country now that, that we could have chosen. Sure. And we feel sorry for all of those people. Yeah. But, you know, we, we, we had to pick one, so we went to Mayfield. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And, and then also, what I find interesting, you know, we, uh, you know, we've seen you sing, obviously. We know about that. But we've also seen you active. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you were with uh, Matthew McConaughey and uh, The Lincoln Lawyer. Oh, yeah. Uh, years any, ago. Any chance of maybe getting back together mm. and maybe a, a, a seat? I don't know. You know, if he wanted me to reprieve that, come back and do that again, <laughs> I, you know, certainly. But... You know, I, the first when I first met him, he, he was like, "You mispronounced my name in that song." I, I, did, a, <laughs> I did a song called "Hold My Beer," and, and I said Matthew McConaughey because it rhymed with. Ah, <laughs> <their name. laughs> that's funny. <laughs> And I said, well, that's it. It rhymed. It didn't rhyme the other way. Anyway. <laughs> that's funny. You had to make it work. Uh, we had someone on the show, um, I guess that was last yeah. week, the coach of LSU, Kim Mulkey. Yeah. Turns out you guys have some history. You're actually one of the 700 plus people that texted her <laughs> we when she her. won, right? Yeah. Just And she said, thanks for the text, you know, but. Uh, we love her. What'd you text her? I just said, congrats on being the GOAT. Uh. <laughs> I mean, everywhere she's been, she's been successful, incredibly mm. successful. Uh. Yeah, yeah. You know, to college together, right? We, we, our freshman year, I was wow. playing football. She was playing basketball at Louisiana wow. Tech. And I would see her, you know, because we ate together on the training table. Wow. All the athletes ate on the training table. And I had a crush on her. But I, I, don't, <laughs> think I, I don't think I ever spoke to her other than to say hello. I really? never had okay. a conversation with her. But years later, I said something about her on stage one night and said I had a crush on her and I did uh, an old Larry Graham song, uh, <laughs> One in a Million, and I said every time I would walk in the student union building this song would be playing because wow. at that time it was a big hit. Mm -hmm. And I said every time I hear this song I'd think about Kim and then she heard that and so. Oh, oh the rest is history amazing. with that. Wait, that's a good story. <laughs> that's a good connection. That. And so we've been good. friends now for years. Yeah. She's great and uh, you know I was just. Well you're both superstars now so. Oh well. I don't <laughs> I'm not in her category. <laughs> well, Trace, thanks so much. I love for that. Being Thank here. you, Trace. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you guys for helping us, you know, say something about Mayfield. Oh, absolutely. Anything we can do. Absolutely. Thank it's going to be so a much. beautiful, beautiful thing. All right. Well, when we come back, we're talking stress and Wellness Wednesday and the three C's to help all of us manage that stress. We'll reveal what they are. And then later in Today Food, we are putting a flavorful twist on tacos. Can I tell you guys a secret? This woman doesn't know this. I'm like obsessed with her. I saw her on Instagram. 
You're going to meet her. She doesn't know that I stalk her on Instagram, but I do. Oh, but she's actually yeah. taking out a restraining Maybe she order. can't hear yes. me. Can you hear me? Hopefully you can't. Uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> well, it got awkward. <laughs> National Stress Awareness Month. So in this morning's Wellness Wednesday, we're taking a look at how stress affects all of us and sharing ways to manage it. So joining us this morning is psychiatrist Samantha Boardman. Dr. Boardman, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. This is a topic, I mean, are you kidding? <laughs> Who doesn't have stress? Uh, so before we get into that and coping with it, let's talk about the different types of stress. A lot of people view it negatively. I have heard that there are positive kinds of stress. I'm sure there are. But <laughs> <laughs> it just seems. You've heard it. Yeah. Just being alive and being human That's things fair. are stressful. Yeah. And it's actually perfectly normal and natural to feel stressed at times. And there is such a thing as good stress. And actually, we're at our best, we're most productive, mm. and we are able to focus when we're stressed out. And there's even evidence that shows that you know, when a little bit of stress can even inoculate us against future depression and mental illness. Really? That's because we learn how to be cognitively flexible. Hmm. We develop new resources. We adapt to the situation. So next time we encounter a stressor, mm -hmm. we got this. Hmm. So what would we do? What are some of the coping mechanisms you would use to maybe turn this to a good thing? Absolutely. So one thing you can do is be as precise as you can about your language. So instead of just saying, oh, I'm stressed, mm -hmm. you have this big cloud hovering over you and you feel overwhelmed by it. Try to pinpoint exactly how you're feeling. Mm. Label it, even break out a thesaurus if you mm. need to. And parents do this with your kids. It can be kind of a fun vocabulary mm. lesson. Are you exasperated? Are you frustrated? Mm. Are you disappointed? Be sort of as narrow as you can and pinpoint it because this gives you sort of the wherewithal to take action around mm. it. And the other thing you can do is, and it sounds sort of paradoxical, is if you want to feel more centered, decenter yourself. What does that mean? So take a step back bet like between you and how you're feeling and your thoughts about that. And imagine if I were a fly on the wall, wow. how would I think about this? Mm -hmm. Or if you think about your future self, like fast forward three months from now, how would I describe this? Mm -hmm. And another thing you can do is, what would I tell a friend yeah. in exactly the same situation? And this gives us some perspective. It's almost like, you know, you're, there's a rainstorm and you're turning on the windshield washers. And it mm -hmm. gives you the, just the ability to sort of peek out and have some clarity. Right, it kind of removes you from the situation exactly. a little bit. Um, you mentioned the three C's to kind of help cope with everything. Walk us through those. Well, so how you respond to stress is so important. And so how can you be deliberate about it? And the three C's are how are you connecting, how are you challenging yourself, and how are you contributing? So when we are stressed out, we tend to sort of fold in on ourselves, we isolate, we pull back. So how are you connecting with others? Probably, you know, one of the best ways we can manage stress is the support of others around us. How are you connecting with your body? How are you connecting with your breath? When we're stressed out, we actually forget to breathe. How are you connecting with nature? And the second C is how are you challenging yourself? And as sort of paradoxical as this sounds, it's, you know, when you're stressed out, how can you, instead of you know, pulling away and doing something mind numbing, can you do something that makes you feel effective and strong? I like or that. A hobby, mm -hmm. like an interest you have, learning something new, and this is a really good stress buffer. Wow. And the third thing is how are you contributing? And 
really the best antidote we have for stress is doing something for somebody else. And this doesn't mean something huge, just small acts of kindness. You know, can you, you know, hold the door for somebody, grab your colleague a coffee, smile, check on your neighbor. Just these little acts mm -hmm. of kindness are tremendous stress. Buffers. I love that. You know what I've been doing is if I'm having a bad day or if I'm feeling crappy, I'll call someone else Another she. and I'll say, yeah, how are you doing? And I don't say anything about myself mm -hmm. and I just try to listen. And then by the time I'm off the phone, I just, I don't know, I feel better. So you, on that note, you have another tactic for handling stress. You call it the bad day backup plan. Well, I think we all need a bad day backup plan because we, we sort of freeze when we're stressed out. You know, you're in flight or fight mode. And so we forget literally what makes us feel good. And we end up doing the very opposite of that. You know, we cancel our plans with friends. Mm -hmm. We, you know, binge watch TV. We stay up late. We eat what's unhealthy. And we engage in sort of emotional junk food. Yep. <laughs> so think of three things. Like, what are three things that you can do? And it might be calling your friend. Or maybe it's like, for me, what I do is I go for a walk in the park. Or I leave my phone. Like, I don't check So you know media. if you're not feeling good, okay, let me go to my backup plan. I know this will kind of get this me out of the rut. It's in your back pocket. And so it's almost like a go-to thing that you do that's personal to you. Mm. Mm. What about if the stress is becoming overwhelming? At what point, doctor, do you need to maybe find some professional help? That's a good question. Absolutely. I mean, so when we're in flight or fight mode constantly, when you're constantly in that sort of elevated level of stress mm -hmm. and it's overwhelming and you feel like, you know, ask yourself, is it interfering with my sleep, with my concentration, with my family, with my friends, with my work? Sometimes we are the last to know. Mm. So have regular check-ins with yeah. your family, your friends, just to say, like, how am I doing here? Because yeah. sometimes they're the best to tell us. Like, you oh, feel like you're a little bit on edge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe check engine light on that battery, and it's time to talk to someone. That's okay. so good. Good advice. Really I'm, useful tips. I know. So Dr. Borman, thank you so much. And for more tips on how to use stress to your advantage, go to today.com. All right, coming up next, we are going to take the stress out of dinner, at least for tonight. We've got tacos with a tasty spin. We'll be right back. Words to live by. <laughs> this morning in Today Food, we are getting a delicious meal with a side of inspiration and humor. Plant-based cook and content creator Roddy Devlukia Shetty is here, and we are making tacos. Roddy, good morning. Good morning. Yay. Thanks for having me. I did my love fest during the commercial break so that I could I be normal yeah. during the segment. Yeah, so, so we're going to be normal now. Time, so she... I really admire you. Thank Whenever you. I'm having a crappy day, you talk about health and wellness. You've really been you're using so... that yeah. a lot I know. Today. I use it twice today, and I'm you're using it crappy. A lot. But you just, you're such a light, and it just yeah. jumps off of your social media. I really appreciate that. And Thank I didn't so realize, much. I knew you were cooking, but I didn't realize that was how you started. Yeah, that's how I started everything. So let's get started on yeah. Yeah. We're so, using cauliflower in tacos. And we are. Cauliflower can be difficult to cut. How would you? It can. So we're going to start off, honestly, I usually just... Throw it, throw it back, and cut off all the green part. Okay. I'm gonna chop that boom, off. Boom, it's gone. It gets a bit messy, but it does. You drop cooking it all over is the never floor. clean. Okay. If it, if it's clean, you're not doing it right. Um, <laughs> I usually just chop it off off the stalk, uh -huh. and that's it. 
chop okay. up into small florets. You can also buy them as florets as but well, it, like this. this is cheaper. Yes, yes. this is much cheaper. Much cheaper. Uh, okay, and you have a lot of seasonings We are, here. so we're going to actually marinate it with different spices um, and also chickpea flour. It's a good egg substitute. So really? I, yeah, it's a great egg substitute. It okay. keeps it really That's thick. That's chickpea flour. This is chickpea flour. Okay. So I've got vegan yogurt in here, but you can use any kind of yogurt that you have at home. Throw in your chickpea flour. Mm -hmm. We've also got some tomato paste. And what's your goal? Because there are a lot of us, I'm not a vegan, but I'm trying to eat healthier and I'll see that you're doing it. So I'm like, okay, let me try it. <laughs> are you trying to help us kind of step into something a little healthier or what's I, your thought? My honest, my honest like desire is to help people figure out how to use spices to make plant-based food taste great. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the time, the issue is we don't, use enough flavor in right, food. Right. And so when you use spices, everything can be so delicious. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we've got garam masala, we've got smoked paprika, and we've got turmeric. So we're gonna I think the other thing that's that important is to let people know what it is. Like they always say, oh, it's such and such that it tastes like. No, it's right. cauliflower. Yeah, yeah. It and it's good. Exactly. Yeah. And in this recipe with this marinade, you can also use tofu, you can use jackfruit. I mm -hmm. use this marinade for so much. Uh, we've also got some oil that's going in here. What kind of oil? Um, well, I use avocado oil when I'm cooking, but you can use olive oil or okay. sunflower oil yeah. too. So we're gonna mix it up, throw in some milk. I'm so curious to taste this. I can't yeah. wait. I'm excited for you guys What kind of milk do you it. use um, to keep it vegan? I use almond milk. Okay. Um, I find, I, I prefer that, but you can use oat milk as well. It's a little bit thicker. Okay. So you're gonna mix that up. Right. And then we're gonna take these kind of like marinate bread. that up. We're gonna marinate up. So I how use, long are you gonna keep that in there? I honestly don't keep it in for long. The spices are quite um, vibrant, and so mm -hmm. I usually just mix it up in that. You take it. I usually use my hands. Love <laughs> hand cooking, but I'm not gonna You'll do be, it right what now. What is that? And just breadcrumbs. Um, breadcrumb it up, and then you're gonna put it onto oh. your oiled tray. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that. then while this goes in the oven, we're making a slaw. Now fennel is a great spring vegetable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't seen one before, it looks like this. Right. Do you do anything with the tops? You do. Okay. You can cut them off and you can use them in your soups. You can use them in your stock. You can freeze them and keep them for later. Mm -hmm. But this is also great for garnish and it tastes amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we're gonna just slice this up. So I usually just chop off the bottom. Do you, how often are you cooking now? People should know you're married to Jay Shetty. You guys are I a, am. a power couple, <laughs> rock star couple. Are you guys we cooking? We should say Jay Shetty's married to you. Yeah, oh, there yeah, you go. Know, right? There you go. You guys are together. Beautiful couple. Do you have time to cook together? I do. Well, do you I, guys, you know what I mean? Because you guys are both so busy. He's not a cook. And I prefer he stays <laughs> out of the kitchen, if I'm completely honest. Um, I usually try and do a lot of meal prep in the morning. So I'll usually mm. do a lot of my chopping and everything in the morning. Okay. Oh. So then I can have it all ready for, for the blush. evening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to chop up, shred it up. If you've got a shredder or a mandolin, okay. and then we've got our slaw. I've got cabbage, carrots, mm -hmm. and uh, the delicious fennel in here. And is there a dressing for there you? There is a dressing. So mm -hmm. what we've got here is it's an apple cider vinegar, mm -hmm. mustard, agave. Go and you can pour it all in. You've got your olive oil, mustard, agave, and apple cider vinegar. It's zesty. Okay. It's really refreshing. Salt, pepper, perfect. Mix it all up. And then we're going to throw that into this. So yummy dressing. Like, I can put that on. You can put that so on. That goes on that. That goes on this, yes. And then what's in this one? Mm -hmm. I feel like the sauces bring this all Honestly, to life. Honestly, everything is about sauces and spices yes. for me. I love that. So Good. this is a yogurt and mint sauce. So we've got yogurt and then there's a zesty mint. We're going to drizzle that on top. Okay. I, you know That's what? Yummy. You, you are a pro in the kitchen. Well. Al is definitely <laughs> oh a pro. Oh, my goodness. I and Dylan. This. They both I should, are. I should just leave, really. And then you're putting this on, this? on some naan? Yes. Yeah, so we're putting it. You can use a wrap. You can use lettuce wraps as well. Mm -hmm. But I traditionally use it on a naan. Go on. So good. Ooh. This is fantastic. Take a you know what? It tastes fresh and yummy. Right. Oh my god. Isn't that good? Yay. Um, so Yum. yeah, then you're just mm. going to throw it on here and drizzle this on top and that's your oh. tikka taco. That's fantastic. Mission Yay. accomplished. Well, Wadi, thank There's you so, so much. There's just so many flavors and they all come together so nicely. Yes. For really these exciting. recipes mm. and more, you can check out today.com slash food. Third yummy. Today will be right back. <laughs> so good. <laughs>
Tomorrow on the third hour, The Breakfast Club star Ali Sheedy on her new series. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, they are catching up with Katie Holmes. Hey, have a great day, everybody, and we hope we'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a good Take day. Take care. Bye-bye. Good morning, welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Just ahead in this half hour, we're going to introduce you to... Because every day, we start our morning so you can take on yours. Catching up with actress and director Katie Holmes. Plus, one woman stepped up for a stranger and changed her life. We will be there as we reunite them for the first time. And Ariana Grande speaking out amid concerns about her appearance, what the singing superstar is saying, and what she wants her fans to know. It's, okay. it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. So Hi, guys. Welcome, welcome. It is Wednesday. It is April 12th. You chose, and we listened. Our Tuesday, Tuesday. Wait, how can they see them behind the desk? Oh, you around? want me to come and see Well, we have I to. Didn't know we were well, I just thing. think you have to see because these are selected. The beautiful fuzzy sweater yes. and adorable skirt. And look at you and I did a silky. Hoo. You know me, I like a silky hoo. ombre. So, silky ombre. Silky ombre. ombre. Can all we right. also just thank uh, our very fashionable twins over there? By the way, these two are quite the team. <laughs> they sure are. We've got Allie and Sean in the house. Okay, they first matched. of all, Allie, first of all, I want to point out I like your skirt, too. It looks very similar to Jenna's. <laughs> Did you wear it on Easter Sunday? I, I gave it a little test drive. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to yeah. make sure I was putting in something cute. Yeah. Um, and Sean and I thought it'd be fun to surprise you guys. Yeah. Okay, so what do you guys think about the selections? They chose this beautiful uh, outfit for Jenna and this really cool one for me. I think the Jenna one was kind of one that was the last one that we put together, and it I think that just happens. And that's always the way. It yeah, it always happens. You're getting dressed to go somewhere. It's like, Usually yes. it's like yep. you're put the last thing You're lives. like, how about this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Sean, me and you, you and me. One of us how is going to have to change. How come you didn't do a... You didn't... I, We'll and you didn't. <laughs> we got to I got to let you have your moment. I don't want to oh. overshine you. That's, that's the whole thing. This shirt's from Zara, by the way. I well, saw when I was putting it on. And this you're the queen of the Zara, Zara silk shirt. Oh, really? Yeah. Y'all, yeah. this is all affordable. Well, thank oh, yeah. you. Thank you, guys. thank you, Fashion Plates. We all love look you. adorable. Y'all look so cute. All right. So it feels like a lot of people are talking about this video that Ariana Grande made last night. Yeah. It was a really personal statement, yeah. um, which she doesn't always do. You know, I think she's private in some ways. Well, she's filming uh, Wicked, the musical, which is incredible, with Cynthia Erivo. And uh, this was a picture that was posted, and then she took to TikTok. Um, she, she was commenting because people, whenever they see a photograph, they like to make their comments about that picture. Yeah. And people have very strong opinions. And I got to tell you, I was like, what are they talking about? What are people, you know, concerned about? So what she did is she went and, and responded to some of these sort of negative criticisms on TikTok or just even the comments at all about, about her, her body. appearance. This yeah. is what she said. I know personally for me, the body that you've been comparing my current body to was the unhealthiest version of my body. I was on a lot of antidepressants and drinking on them and eating poorly and at the lowest points of my life when I looked the way you consider my healthy, but that in fact wasn't my healthy. Hmm. Wow. It's it's. Really interesting, and I think the, sh the reason why she did that is she said, 
you never know what someone is going through. Like maybe stop just a beat before you write something, even if it co comes with love, like, you know, is everything okay? We're concerned. We're concerned, et cetera, et cetera. whatever it is. I think it's, I think it is that thing about judgment and I think everyone is guilty of it in some way. Like if you're in line at a grocery store and some person in front of you is throwing a fit and you're like, why is that person yeah. being so rude? You don't know that she just got a parking ticket. She doesn't have the money to pay it. She's wondering how she's going to do that and buy the groceries she has. You don't know the yeah. store. We don't know. We come in at the end of the story yes. and we're judging based on like why, that yeah, moment. Why would, why would snap? They, or what's that lady doing on the street? That person snapping at her kid. Yeah. And you're like, you don't know what happened Before. prior to that moment. You know what? In fact, I read this beautiful thing mm. that to sort of teach empathy. Um, which not everybody is born with. Mm -hmm. You think of, pretend you're in a, a taxi and somebody's mm -hmm. rude. You think either of that person is a child, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that everybody was a child. Mm -hmm. See mm -hmm. him or her as a beautiful child. Mm -hmm. And it slowly sort of brings the temperature right. down. Right, picture them at like three years old, three four years four. old. Yeah, yeah, that's a good or one. Or I sometimes think, of people as parents. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what, maybe he had mm -hmm. news today mm -hmm. about his child, even if he's not one. Right. But like that kind of stress. Right. Imagine him holding a baby. And uh, then it helps you have empathy for whoever calm. it is. And I think for Ariana Grande, like she's right now in in rehearsals for Broadway. Yeah. There's nothing more grueling and Dancing also more satisfying and, yeah. than the work she's putting in. Nobody understands what where she is in this moment. Yeah. She, she's talking about how she is at her healthy point now. Her body is where she wants yeah. it to be, not the way it used to be. But I think when you do something publicly, when you when you poke someone publicly, even if you do it with good intention, yeah. it's and sort by of the like, way, that public can be on Instagram for a high school kid. Yeah. You know, you, your daughter could do it on Instagram. That's like it's not open to everybody. Right. You don't have to be famous. It still hurts. Right. And also, you don't need someone to tell you something. Yeah. Like it's your body. You know what's going on. You don't yeah. need someone. Have you ever had that kind of yeah. situation where someone? hit you in a place that you were like, this is a super ouch for yeah. me. I mean, I think we all have, and it's mm -hmm. sort of like, it's so interesting because people do hit you right where it sort of hurts. Well, it's, like, your, it's your vulnerable point. Yeah. I had a, a boyfriend in seventh grade that broke up with me mm -hmm. after we went like swimming together, mm -hmm. after he saw me in a bathing suit. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like even sometimes now when I feel great, I yeah. have three kids, three C-sections, yeah. I feel like really in my body and I think of it as a beautiful yeah. thing. Like I'll walk in a pool and have a moment of Where like, <gasps> And, that and so, and that, all and those so, years yeah, ago. like there's been times, I mean, when we've done this show where people have written about our yeah, body yeah. and it feel, it takes you back to that moment. And sometimes it is body what and about sometimes you? it's something else. I remember mine. I don't, I mean, online stuff, I don't usually pay attention, pay attention to, to or work, try not to or try not to, but I did. And I'll never forget this. I got a letter that was addressed to me in somebody's handwriting to my house, and I remember I opened it and I thought, oh, because sometimes people yeah. get your home address and they put a picture in yeah. where you sign it or they say something or whatever. I opened the letter and it was something along the lines of, how dare you bringing a child into this world at your age? Don't you know what you're doing to that child? Like it went on and on and I was, I was like, I took my breath away because that actually was my ouch. Yeah. I was scared. Yeah. Like, is this something that um, that is smart for me to do? And am I helping or am I gonna ultimately be harming? Yeah. Like I've thought about that. And when I read it, I thought someone took a pen and sat at a table and put it and wrote that down and got a stamp and mailed it, like went to all that yeah. trouble yes. to say that to me. And I remember thinking, Online, you kind of go, well, someone went like that. Yeah. This took care and time and research. And I, and so when I was feeling terrible, because I did, I was, my dad passed when I was in college. And I remember thinking, we have our parents for a period of time. I know the foundation he left. Mm. I know it was worth every second of that time. So I thought about that too. But it, it's a real, it can hit you in a place that 
that um, where you're the most vulnerable. I feel like that's like the kind of cruelty yeah. of these and whether it takes the care and time yeah. to mail yes. it and do everything. It's like, or just sending or, it. Or how can we teach our kids or just even typing the people that may have thought it was good intention. Right. I just was trying to help. Like, you look so thin. I want the best. Yeah. For you. Yeah. Like, we need to stop commenting on women's yes, bodies. Enough. Period. Yeah. You said it perfectly. We're in our bodies. We know. We when know. someone says, oh, you look big, I'm like, I walk around in my body. Yeah. I don't need you telling me what I already know. I know. I know that. I live here. But also, this is me. It's so much more about the way you look. Yeah. It's about the way you feel, yes. which is what yes. she's saying. Yes. Nobody knows, knows what was going on with her. Right. So stop. Stop. You yeah, know? I agree. And I'm glad she said something. Yeah, me too. Will you, I, so, will you well, tell? Yeah. So please. it's interesting because I think you and I have been talking all, like mm -hmm. both of us, and mm -hmm. I can speak for you because mm -hmm. I know this, all we want is loving children. Mm -hmm. Like we don't need the star mm -hmm. kid, the this, no, the that. No. We want kids that are kind. Yes. So the way you do that is you model it. And mm -hmm. there was a church service um, at this weekend on Easter, and they spoke about my grandfather. And mm. I'd, I'd never heard this story, but I read it to my kids mm. last night. Um, it said... He was country day's best athlete. The school year always ended with an obstacle course run. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, before this, it said he was nicknamed Have Half because he always divided any treat that he had in half to share with anyone oh, that wanted God. it. Wow. He was country day's ba best athlete. The school year always ended with an obstacle course run that he always won. He was getting ready to go away to school. So his teachers asked if the other students could get a head start. He agreed. When the teacher gave a sign, George started to run like the wind. Mm. At one point, he had to get down on all fours and climb quickly through a barrel. As he crawled out, he discovered a chunky classmate named Bennett McNichol, who was not an athlete, had gotten stuck in the barrel next to him. So George stopped running, mm. leaned down to free Bennett, costing him his precious time in the race itself. George and Bennett crossed the finish line mm. together. Bennett tied Bush. He said it was mm. the highlight of his life. Oof. Bush's biographer, John Meacham, said that this is the kind of story that you would tell about your dad or brag about yourself. But Meacham noted, I've never heard this story from anyone in the family. I heard it from Bennett McNichol. Mm. He went around telling the story for 70 years. Oh. While writing Bush's biography, Meacham asked the former president why he did what he did. President Bush looked at me like I was an idiot, or calls Meacham. <laughs> he said, I did it because I never got stuck in a barrel, and I thought that Bennett needed some help. Meacham notes, he didn't say, I did it because the Bible tells me so, mm -hmm. or because my parents raised me to free people from barrels. <laughs> he said it was simply the right thing to do. Oh, oh my God, that is so beautiful. And yeah. you didn't know that story? Mm -mm. Jeez. But I read it to my kids, and ah. I don't know like, if that's what you're supposed to do, but I want them to be the person yes. that always helps somebody out of a barrel. Oh, my God, that was so beautiful. Um, okay. What's coming up? <laughs> Well, it's a big holiday around what here. Is it? It's National Grilled Cheese Day. Oh, yeah. Did I get cheesy coming up after this? Oh, my God. That is so... Give me that. Give me that. That's John Favreau. Way, that's a that scene from from the movie Chef, 2014. 
crunch into that. Can you I taste it? I feel like Hoda should be like a national grilled cheese correspondent oh, or something. Oh, Because, or like, it's like as if we were just watching somebody so play a sport. She's so like, yeah, good. rip it. No, okay, push cut it, it. Cut it. <laughs> okay, if there's any food that deserves its own holiday, it's that one. Yeah. And today is National, National Grilled, Grilled Cheese, Cheese Day. Day. Okay. You know, um, remember when Jen and I went rolling to pin the rolling pin when it was <laughs> National Pie Day back in December? Then there was more. There was more. We threw down for <laughs> National Pizza oh, Day. That was ugly. the one constant is our friend Katie, who is always <laughs> trying to walk. Okay, us so through. we're going bread to bread. Yeah, right? we're going bread to okay, bread. What's happening here? Katie? So both of you have the exact same setups, although a couple of, of different topping options. Jenna requested some truffle salt. Hoda yeah. wanted Don't regular copy. butter. Um, so what we're gonna do is Don't we're gonna build our sandwiches. Yes, yes. And then I'm gonna take them back and I'm gonna grill them off. And okay. then at the end of the show, we're gonna do a little payoff and we're gonna taste them out. Okay. So, so let's go over the ingredients. Okay. Let's go. Bacon, we have some avocado. I threw in some donuts because sometimes people put make a grilled cheese out of donuts. I don't know. Just I've you never kooky. You I know. Thought, I know. You, thought you made it seem like you threw in the donuts. Uh, no, I was just trying to throw you. I didn't like okay. that. Okay. Okay. So we're about to get started. You mm -hmm. get to first choose your butter or mayo. Big topic. But we're gonna put 45 seconds on the clock. Always okay. butter. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Totally. Always. Right. Yes. Ready? Go. Set. Go. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, wait. Jenna. She went, both went butter. Of course. You have to go butter, Katie. Hoda has a thick slice. I like whole grain. That's what I here. like. No, you know wait. what I got? Now, Katie, <laughs> Katie, I'm going to tell you something. Tell this me, tell is me. the side. You're going to put uh, butter on the pan okay. here. Okay. 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 So this cool. is grill grill. Oh, and I like the got same it. consideration. Okay. Oh, Whoa. Okay. Oh, my. Two okay. types of cheeses here. Now. Two types of cheeses. No, you got I'd like that same gotta consideration, go. please, Katie. Please. I got you. Oh. What's this? Swiss? This is uh, Gruyere. Pepper Jack. We have American and See, cheddar. unfortunately, this butter has come off, Katie, so I need a little help. Okay. We can just spread a little bit more. Okay. I'm done. Right. We'll do one sandwich. Wow. That was a speedy Gonzalez. Um, do so we have more time? Okay. So remember. Ten seconds. Grill this side. Okay. Put it on top. I don't. You know what I mean? Got to pop it on Put it on the plate. I don't think you can add anything, though. <laughs> no, just like that. Lots Beautiful. of wood. And I want you to cut on the diagonal. Diagonal. Yeah, not straight down I like down mine straight down, please. Okay, but, so, so remember, Katie, yeah, I need yeah. butter. Because I couldn't. Wait, you, have to I, cook you it. want me to put butter on the inside, too? I want butter on the inside. Grill it. That, oh. Yes, people. I don't know what? that that's fair. No, that is because I no, couldn't. Katie. You do it okay. while you're cooking. Okay? okay. We're back. Katie. All right, Katie is going to grill these sandwiches, and then we're going to have a special judge to announce this later in the show. Look forward to that. All right, coming up next, another Katie we love around here, Katie Holmes. Yes, she's here with actress Julia Mayorga to talk about their buzzy new movie. It's really special, right after this. Holmes exploded onto the Hollywood scene 25 years ago, and she's been busy ever since, acting, writing, producing, and directing, most recently for her latest project, Rare Objects. Katie stars alongside Julia Mayorga. The uh, movie is based on a popular novel. It follows a young woman who reclaims her sense of self through friendship. Take a look. I've been trying to forget my memories. Sometimes I think isn't it better to not remember the times that you were happy? Or better to make new ones. Mm. Profound already. Yes. Hi, ladies. Good morning. Good to see both of you. Wow. When you say labor of love, I don't know what you would call this, but you've loved this project, Katie, for six years plus, I think, and now it's finally coming to be. What's it like putting it out into the universe? 
I mean, it's it's so exciting, and it's it's so exciting to have worked with Julia, oh. and she is spectacular in this film and carries the movie beautifully. <laughs> um, and it's such an emotional performance, and so I'm so proud that the world gets to see her in this. Um, and so it's it's very exciting. <laughs> You're very proud. Yes. <laughs> That's cute. Julia, so you yeah. have acted before, yeah. of course. You're an American rest, but this is your first full-length film. Yeah. Talk to me about what happened when you heard that Katie wanted you for this part. Um, heart attack moment in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm familiar with Katie's work, and obviously she's a, a wonderful actress and director. Um, and you know, I think. It's like a pinch me moment, you know? I'm scared, I, of course I was scared, I'm like, can I do this? But as well as like, oh my God, I would be crazy if I don't take this opportunity and do it. And showing that vulnerability is not easy. I think a lot of time women, all of us, we put on a coat of armor and walk through life. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to see the cracks. I'm strong, look at me. Mm -hmm. But you have to really tap into that vulnerable part of you. How did you do that? Um, I think with vulnerability, there is strength. So I don't mm -hmm. see it, yeah, you know, I don't see it completely different. Um, it, you know, I think when there's so much like security on set and there's mm -hmm. just, you know, you feel very comfortable, I think it's easier. So mm -hmm. I think I was just taking it moment by moment. And she's a very, very hard worker. Yeah. Um, so precise in her uh, performance. And so it was such a pleasure because it was, the preparation was incredible and, and so and, you, you really did an mm -hmm. amazing job. Well, well, speaking of hard work, so are you. Yeah. You put a lot of work into everything you do, and you directed this. Mm -hmm. So how do you create like a space mm -hmm. where everybody can feel safe and seen and heard and give you their best performance? Uh, well, it's a true collaboration. I mean, this is my third film, and you're always learning how to do it better. And um, so I... There were days that I wasn't great, but there were days that I felt okay about it. Um, but I really looked to everyone else, and, and luckily, Julia had great ideas, brought so much to the table. We had a wonderful cinematographer, production designer, costume designer. All of the actors really sh arrived mm -hmm. with the characters, mm -hmm. um, and so it was much easier than... Um, I didn't feel like I was doing it all on my yeah. own. I was looking to everybody yeah, like... Team. Well, when you, you when you research a role, you research a role, and I don't know if you remember back to when you played first daughter. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, to, I, 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 I just want to bring you back because that was very important. Okay. First of all, Julia is like, I have no okay. idea what yeah. you're talking okay. about. So, I actually do know what you're talking so about. So here it is. So Jenna so happened to be a first daughter during this time, <laughs> and Katie, in your in your research. Did you ever reach out to a young lady named Jenna Bush <laughs> and try to get a little intel info? I believe I did. You did? You made a phone call? And I, Julia, I was with my college roommates. We were watching Dawson's Creek. I'm, I'm not joking. We stop. turned it off. Yeah. And I'm like, who called me from, I mean, I lived in Texas. Who called me from LA? Mm -hmm. Listen to the message. And it was Katie, and I was too embarrassed. I mean, also, had you come and done research, she would have been like, wow, <laughs> this is quite boring. Aww. But, and, and I never fell in love with the Secret Service man. Yeah. But I did have a friend make out with one. <laughs> <laughs> Sure you did. I mean, that seems like a job of a friend, right? Right. Just to, it's not just appropriate to test it out. for me, right? But a friend could. It's got to. Wait, but how about her? How about she was watching Dawson's Creek at the time? That's, have you ever seen Dawson's Creek? I haven't seen Dawson's Creek. You have not, what? girl. Girl, we need to pop it's some pop class. How would you not? Yeah. It's I okay. Know. It's okay. Is it? <laughs> you know what? I think it's actually okay. Like I might rewatch it with my daughter yeah. soonish. She's ten. Yeah. When do you think it's appropriate? Oh. Eleven? Twelve? <laughs> Ten is good. Yeah, Ten right? Is good. It's like yeah. wholesome and lovely. It's very wholesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, I wow. can't even. I, and I'm sorry I never called you back. <laughs> Why? Because you were embarrassed? Because I was. Well, my real life didn't really match the movie, but <laughs> the research you would have learned would have been kind of gross. <laughs> well, that was, a, that was such a, 
it was such a fun movie to do. And, yeah. I, and I was looking to you. I mean, I just felt like, what is that like? I mean, yeah. to to carry that, and you've, you've carried it so beautifully. Aww. It's so lovely. Thank yeah. you for so saying sweet. that. Yeah, I'm yes. going to cry. <laughs> we're, having a, we're having a moment. A but moment. But it's anyway. a girl party. Yeah. And, this, Thanks, and that is what this movie is. Yeah. It's about female friendship yes. and beautiful. love and female power. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Rare Objects hits theaters and is available to stream starting this Friday. Thanks, you guys. Thanks Thank so much. You. Coming up next, two friends who have not seen each other in person in eight years reunited live. Do not miss the big surprise coming up right after this. And we're so Okay, now to a story that's gonna make you feel good today. Mm -hmm. We've been so excited mm -hmm. about this. Surprise reunion between two dear friends. Mm -hmm. Our viewer, Deborah Rushing, joins us right now and she wrote in to honor her friend, Helen Boyd. But here's the cool twist. They've only met in person one time and that was eight years ago. Deborah, hi, we're so happy hi. that you're here. I mean, you guys met one time and you have this bond. How was that? This bond is unbelievable. One time, one sentence with her, we sat down, we started having conversations, and she has never left my side eight years later. And she really helped you when you needed her the she most. She helped me the, she helped me so much during that time of need and gave me such direction and positivity and hope in my faith and so forth too. And you call her your her. angel, which I, I think is super sweet. Uh, I call her my angel because she literally dropped out of the sky in front of me. And like I said, it's when I needed her the most. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Helen is here today. As you can see, she's backstage. She has no idea that Deborah is here. Yeah. Helen thinks she's coming on our show to talk about how she helped encourage another friend, Chris, to start a candle making business. But she is in for a surprise. She's about to find out while she's really here. I love this. All right, let's take a look at Deborah's story and how one hug from Helen transformed her life. I rode into the show to honor my good friend and mentor, Helen Boy. Eight years ago, I was downtown at Forsyth Park. That morning was a very difficult morning for me. I was in a relationship that was truly not healthy. I left the house and I took a seat on the bench. I was very troubled by what had taken place in my life and the situation that I was involved in. I was at a very low, low point. I felt like I just was lost and I needed help. When I'm sitting on that bench and as I looked up, I saw Miss Helen standing in front of the fountain in front of me, looking at me. I knew that from the moment I looked at her that there was something very special about her. There was just no way somebody could appear just dropping out the sky in front of me like that. She walked over, she gave me a hug. I needed that hug. I hadn't had a hug in a long time. She took time, an hour and a half, to sit with me on a bench and listen to me talk. I thought, how could God send me somebody so wonderful in a time of need? When Helen walked away, I felt like a brand new person. I felt a hundred pounds lighter. I changed my relationship. I moved. Things were still hard. I had to start all over and not knowing what you were going to do, where you were going, and how things were going to work out. I have come a very long way since that day eight years ago. I am happy, I'm peaceful, 
and I'm joyful. I've only met Helen one time and that was in the park. So we have just maintained and built this relationship over the telephone. Now, more than anything, I want to see her face to face so that I can thank her and see her and just hug her and let her know how much I love her and grateful that she is in my life. I am uh, just so excited. It's all I can do to contain myself and I can't wait to share my joy. Yes! All Helen. right, Helen, come, come on, on out! out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sam! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Look at you! Oh, my God! Look at you! Oh, my God! You are real. You're not just my angel. God, I'm so good to see you. Oh, I want a Helen hug. Oh, yes. oh my God. Oh, oh hi, Helen. Oh, oh this is so good. <laughs> come sit, come next, sit to next to Deborah. Oh my, oh my gosh. Wow. wow. Okay, so oh. you probably realize you're not here to talk about candles. <laughs> <laughs> but what does it feel like to see oh, each no other again? Oh my God. You know, it's a blessing. Um. That day when I saw her, because I was with a friend that was doing, um, she's, she sings gospel songs, and she was wanting to do a photo shoot out there at the park. And then I told her, hold on a minute, and she went on, and then I said, I see this woman over there. I said, I gotta go to her. And I just came up on her. She didn't, she didn't know where I came from. And I seen that she was just in the, just really the stray of just yeah. something was going on with her. And I just told her, it's gonna be okay. Yeah. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm a friend and I can help you through this. Even though I'm from Atlanta and she's in Savannah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna take your number. Uh -huh. And for all these years, yeah. I've been coaching and talking to her, inspiring her, and she looks, oh, Dab looks so great now. I mean, oh my God. her story, but it's, it's a movement. And she needed someone to come into her life at that time. And I was placed there at that time. Oh, wow. Deborah. What about for you? <laughs> yeah, you finally have your moment eight years waiting. I know you've been wanting this. Yeah. It has. It's all I wanted to do was to look her in the <laughs> eyes and to hold her hand and give her the biggest hug and thank you for the bottom of my soul for I know. Mm. You have taught me so much about positivity and how we can go along, how faith we can grow it. Yeah. And we've got to give thanks to God mm -hmm. because she was. She was my angel sent to me. Yeah. She mm -hmm. was. Yeah. And, and it's the power of one person seeing somebody yes. in need and doing something about it. Right. We Not know, walking past and yeah. saying, I should have stopped. Stop. You were called and you went right there. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, yes. We want you all to have more time, though, to catch up in yeah, person. We sure do. Yeah. So we have something special for you. We have a car waiting outside oh. because immediately after the show, you're going to go to lunch at the beautiful Parker's oh. at Thompson Central Park. It's a beautiful <laughs> restaurant. Y'all go can and catch up. Lunch. Oh. And be and together. Enjoy it. It's a sun splash day for you. Oh, you guys, thank you so oh much for God. sharing this oh beautiful moment with oh, us. You've just moved so many yeah. people to yes. always do good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank oh you. Gosh. Thank you. We want more with y'all, too. Yes. We'll be back right after this. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
We are back and we're talking all about bras. So if you struggle to find the perfect fit, you are not alone. Yeah, but luckily for all of us, we've got an undergarment educator in the house, Kim May Caldwell. She's here to save the day. Yes. Hi, Hi girl. Hello. Okay, so listen, I have been fitting folks for 15, 18 years. Okay. Wow. And so many people are wearing the wrong size or the wrong style for them. So I took three really amazing women to Journal, one of my favorite shops in New York okay. City for fitting. Let's take a look. Cool. You sold that lead. Hi, I'm Cotty, and for the life of me, I've never been able to find a comfortable bra. Hi, my name's Kelly. I'm officiating a good friend's wedding next month, and I need a strapless bra for my dress. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm currently 30 weeks pregnant with my third baby. I'm looking for something to feel confident and supported. If you were gonna go shopping without me, what bra size would you start with? A 36C. Believe it or not, the back of the bra is the most important part. We're starting nice and snug on the loosest hook because as your bra stretches, it's just gonna start riding up. So you put it in the hook. This will help your bra last so much longer. And ideally, we want your straps to be able to go up just about an inch off your shoulder with some force. Okay, let's try a couple more bras. We're trying your usual size of mm -hmm. 36C. How do you feel on this? Too snug here. So believe it or not, it's actually too loose. And it feels tight in the front because all of the weight is sort of riding up and resting here on the shoulders. You said you would usually shop for a 36 c correct? Yes. Okay, and this is a 34 F. What? Wow. This is everything I'm looking for. Okay, everyday bra for Cotty. Check. What size bra would you start with? 36 c Okay. She's gonna be wearing a black dress, and you wanna wear dark under dark, so that way the color doesn't bleed from the dress to the bra. I also am looking for something that has a nice wide back, so it can lay nice and flat for her, anchor in place, and not go anywhere. It has five hooks going up and down here, so we are positive that this is going to stay in place. I like the wide band yeah. and all of the hooks. I don't know if I love it quite as much as the last one. We're getting the cup coming in a little bit onto your body and that's causing this little bit of spillover. Let's try one more. There's little reinforcements along this band here to help it not roll. It's super comfortable, I feel supported. Now that I'm pregnant, I really don't yeah. know my things. So for maternity, we want something with no underwire because her body is going to be changing a lot. We also want enough coverage that she's not going to be spilling out. Nursing tanks are a really great option for the third trimester or for nursing. Kelly, how do you feel? I mean, pure <laughs> So this is lower support. It also does have a little bit of a shelf here. I wanted to get you something that is not a nursing bra, is not technically a maternity bra. We still have some flexibility here because this is a mesh cup. We've got a nice wide ballet back, so it's giving you the anchor and support that you need. Okay, how do you feel in this bra? This was made for me. Yeah. I feel comfortable, yeah. I feel secure, okay. and I feel confident. Yes. All right, this was fascinating. Yeah. We're all on the wrong size, most of us are. <laughs> yeah, we okay. definitely are. You're gonna help us show how to get the right bra for our bodies. And here's bodies. the thing too, even the best bras in the wrong size are gonna be a bad fit. Yeah. Right? So you have to go to your local fitter, make sure you're getting okay. fit for these things. These are brand new, exciting styles that okay. I wanted to get so to So what is yeah, what this one good for? This is Pepper, this is really great for petite bust. And okay. by the way, this is a female founded company just like all the rest here today. Feels and good. this is for double A to B cups. Okay. This is called the All You Bra. So it's all you without any extra oomph or too much padding if you want. Just I like really the lace Okay, we sort of need, well, yes. I What's sort of need some extra support. This is a good sort of minimizer, okay, right? Okay, this is just a great supportive bra. This is a five cup bra from Understands. Now, the cool thing about this one, which I'm wearing now in a 34 triple D, y'all, this has a <laughs> flexible underwire. Oh, oh, nothing has that. So Wait, it's this feels good. flexible and comfortable. This is the Selma bra and truly Selma? one of my favorites from this new brand, new to me brand. By the way, it feels mm -hmm. soft. I like it's, this. That's what I mean. It's supportive, but is, is this a minimizer? 
This is, I mean, this is the thing. A bra on the right size, kind of like a t-shirt on the right size, will sort of minimize you. Okay. Yeah, I not technically, okay. but it does. Okay, okay. what about these? Okay, I'm so excited about this one. So this is from Livy Lou Lane, a brand new company. Ooh, look. This is called the Special. Back to You bra, and Back she just she created it because after she had kids, she sort of lost her test, uh, tissue density, like a lot of people do, and she decided against getting surgery. Instead, she made this amazing bra. Look at the inside, y'all. This has a very cool Beautiful. little pocket in the yeah, inside cool. here, so and then in. three. Three different levels of inserts. Blow these, up. these are made with <laughs> water and oil. Water, okay. water and oil. And so they You're feel right. more natural. Just make sure nobody does. pokes you with the pen. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, okay, we only have one more second. This is a good um, sort of Sorry, I'm sure, bra, right? Okay, so over me. here, this is we're dancing. This is from a Wheel of Warrior. This is the braless when you want to not wear a bra and you want to go braless, but you still want some support that that little bit of ribbing and compression will keep you What up. size for this? You can't, you These have to go be small. extra small to 3X, oh, and 3X? they truly support, okay. great for traveling, wow. great for awesome. sleeping. Don't you love how Thank she loves her you. job? Yeah. Her job so I know, we want you to measure us. All okay. right, for any of these items, head to today.com slash shop. Coming up next, which one of us will be the big cheese? Mm -hmm. We're gonna announce the winner of our Come on, Katie. Oh, girl, yeah, the diagonal. Face oh, off. Oh, right, girl, the diagonal. Is that yours? Oh, yeah. Sir Katie Stilo celebrating National Grilled Cheese Day. We've also got our special judge, our yes. stage manager, Davey. We love Davey. Yeah. All right. Okay, so earlier Hoda and I each made a version of the sandwich. Katie finished cooking them. Okay. Let's reveal what we have. Okay. If a diagonal cut, we're not gonna well, tell we it. Well, we know now. Okay. I don't really mind the, the okay. diagonal or the straight cut. Okay, go ahead, Davey. Go ahead. All right, wait. I gotta get this out of the way. Cool. All, All right, right, Davey, so give it a go. This one. This one, Ooh. wow. Nice, nice. Right. good yeah. luck. Good, yeah. job. good luck. Nice, the, not a lot of cheese in there. Well, there's a lot going you on. You got a minute, here. baby. You Come on now. <laughs> yeah, you're a sage man. You should, to you should know for time. <laughs> okay. What do you feel? Okay. Well, hold on, keep going. Actually, next. I, I didn't know if the avocado was going to work, but it does. Okay. Uh, well, it works very well. All right, here we go. Extra cheesy. I need oh. a napkin. Oh. Look at this. Oh. I got it. Come on. This is, I, now I know who this is. Mm. All right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Dave, who's the winner of the golden I, cast iron skillet? I gotta say. Who's the winner? I'm still, I still got run. cheese going. I'm, I'm going with that one. Yeah. This one right here. Go to win! Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on, that crunch. I'm gonna do Haiti. I know. You I know. know what it is. What? Crunchy it's bread. The bread. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Crunchy bread. Crunchy bread. The double toast. What, what, kind of we, bread? what did you use? I used uh, what I use. Uh, a thick cut, a thick cut whole grain bread. Okay, what do we have? Oh, I want. You want a golden casserole skillet? Oh, it's so cute. Oh, you can give it to your kids to play kitchen. That's so cute. Right after this, Davey, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations, Davey. Thank you. Mm. Did you like the avocado and tomato?
Coming up tomorrow, guys, the stars of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Tony Shalhoub, and Alex Borstein. Plus, our girl Bobby goes on some dates. Oh, we can't She's wait. She's going to fill us in. Oh, and the perfect sandwich for a picnic. Oh, I love a sandwich and a grilled cheese. And congratulations, Toda. Oh, thank Bye. you. Bye. When we do our show, we're inviting someone to come in. We are informing you, showing the world has multiple sides and beautiful sides. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. civil rights trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African-American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. 
hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, the list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time, they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter Four. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hello. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We it's are great enjoying to everything. Good. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie to Chase to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service, service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. 
We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's. Dizzy Calepsi, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. 
Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. It's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see it's you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so, he, yeah. after a meal here, after yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, is there in the kitchen. What's that like? 
Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you and the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy. And always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. We uh -huh. add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, See yeah. How gentle he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. And this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what a thigh person. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect? Wow, the seasoning, moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you. Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come. 
Great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at b g Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activist UEP Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come to the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. 
And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. Say cheesecake. As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. scream, you scream, I, okay, I'm gonna stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington Candy Shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or mm, an ice cream float. I gotta tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn of the century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called Soda Jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002, but they weren't sure what to do with the storefront until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899, and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love. 
and frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. The kitchen itself was a preservation element, restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old-fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury, largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs. But a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we have the invention of Philadelphia style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, a black man who was a White House chef working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker, and he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man. He later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too, and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. And we're proud to be here today. Bassett's was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women. To have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. 
Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specks on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specks in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits. Like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter, but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues and you know can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Coming up, I visit a family-owned ice cream shop in Harlem and get a sweet surprise. Finish this sentence. Ice cream is love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> and see. We're up here in Harlem where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, How nice to meet you. you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife, and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery, which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're gonna give you the scoop, Al. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in DC for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, and that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this, you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Patricia oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and our, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no, no, this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. 
to the Not to Harlem, not to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African American, and from the Caribbean. And Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem, we're channeling childhood memories, we're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba. And where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. Mm. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make, you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about the, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Bumford's? Yes! Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patrushka learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Tomford's. A small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference, and they were like, hey, she's opening an happy ice cream shop. This is crazy. And they're like, oh my gosh, It'll, it's like Tomford's. Tomford's was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem, at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop, but after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto, the sweet life is a love affair between community and food and it also has a historical meaning. The sweet life is also you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking for the sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom Ford's or talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I, think, I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with little league kids or when you live in a city you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not going to pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>
it's time for Sunday School. Say amen, say hallelujah. <laughs> amen! Hallelujah! <laughs> my Sunday School teachers at Harlem Sugar Hill Creamery kicked off my lesson with a special treat, a one-of-a-kind flavor made just for me. You should learn to scoop with your own, uh, my own flavor. Your own flavor. My own flavor. Yeah. Wow. All of the ice cream served at Sugar Hill Creamery is small batch, each flavor taking two days from start to finish. The difference between a small batch and large batch is one is a freezer. These machines allow more experimentation with mix-ins. The reason why it's homemade and why it's better to do small batch, for example, is you have freedom to do whatever the hell you want. You're not beholden to what can fit into a automated machine that, like for example, can't put a particular like sauce in it because it'll be too thick or you know jam something you know things like that and now back to Sunday school so what's my flavor so your flavor so we've heard around the way uh -huh. that you uh, that you're a fan you're a fan of cookies and cream I am also you like sweet potato pie so I do okay so this is a combination and pecans of, well right? the pecan element is yeah. a part of the sweet potato pie but, but yeah. yes I can tell you guys are married <laughs> For my signature flavor, Nick started with a sweet cream base, then adding Nilla wafers. Blended in, made a uh, graham cracker pie crust with pecan, Ooh. Uh, roast sweet potatoes, cook it uh, down with basically it's a holiday IPA, mm -hmm. and uh, poured the beer in it, blended it up, and then made it like a custard with, uh, with eggs. Wow. A lot goes into that. A lot goes into it. And a lot goes into forming the perfect scoop. But picture perfect scoops wouldn't be the same without one very important invention. The ice cream scoop was invented by a black man. Alfred Crawley holds a patent for the ice cream mold and disher. And that's the scoop that's like, it has a little handle that you squeeze and the thing scrapes and the ice cream plops out. Uh, but he invented that in 1897 and sort of revolutionized ice cream culture. So the side here is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you, you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta da! Yeah. So, the cup, got a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too, because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm -hmm. almost, oh, that's a sad yeah. scoop. No, no, look, look, now you're going to form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're... Mm -hmm. Now it's forming. Oh, yep, look, at, look that. at that. Now, oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it is. Good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right, time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually... Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, Your Neck of the Woods. Oh, I like it. Get it? <laughs> wow. And this, this is, is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best-selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So this is uh, named after my wife, who's the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. Smart man. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. Coming up, a whimsical creamery in Las Vegas, known for its colorful creations.
You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, Creamberry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults, it's funny, they would share. <laughs> in Las Vegas, a few miles off the strip, is the flashy, fabulous, and insta-famous ice cream shop Creamberry, opened in 2016 by husband and wife team Danny and Rosalina C, hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe. We set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy, innovative desserts into one place. For Danny, it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruit on top for the shave ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino hala hala. Recognizing the power of social media, Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram, and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, the this birthday burrito. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and uh, of course eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And long behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it will just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning of the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it and it doesn't taste good, they're not going to come back yeah. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food, but the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. And luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really 
love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like a lot of people repost it too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkled candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh yeah, maybe not too much, it's maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Creamberry. We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America with interesting architecture, diverse restaurants and specialty shops. It's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. It's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor and so from Gold Rush, they ended up doing farming, mm -hmm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, 
and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong, arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple rolls of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and you give me plenty of food, I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew, but it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open.
Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and take care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved View Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone 
for this century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable. So much history and so many memories, you know. A lot of patrons that have been here, they've told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over a hundred plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet-style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100-year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low-income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age. And if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't, we can't do that we changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple of instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college. And there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive. So it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. 
despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, people are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we're, we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or an old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. To learn more about the future of Chinese-American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, Ciao. nice to meet Good you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studied cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right, because it's all over the United States. Right? So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then They go somewhere else, right. To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly, and then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. 
Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners is that part of the, the the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it, but the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the walk stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run, but it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of Food and Wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusiony and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni, right? Uh, cooked halfway, and this is Velveeta. Mm -hmm. um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with. We're just going to cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added. The mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's see. Here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Oh, well, um, why not? <laughs> Fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. Just a little spice. 
the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the little sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa, you've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market, give them your business. We have lost so much during the pandemic, and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now there are dozens of Coney's in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. The Coney. It's, it's a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit style Coney in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to How see you it? again. Good to see it's been you. a long time. It is. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reigns from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner, has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis setting off a wave of global migration. 
By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're going to go into the hot dog business, but we're going to top it with something Greek. Now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kuros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history from national to Kirby's, to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island, to L. George's, to Leo's, and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. Is we that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carry out and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't on this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. Yeah, we're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa, remember the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili's a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference, I'm gonna stop you. Okay. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the, hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments people about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here, but each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's gotta be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously, but I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family, it's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family, we don't know any different. Coming up, I learned how to make the quintessential Coney. One up! Right there, nice shot. Yeah.
At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vi vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of cones. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing. Yes. It's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lambskin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get. Pork, beef, and a and that's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun. It's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's they, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. See, you know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little, grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy, some chili. Add a little more, you know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices, yes. that's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime, nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. Nice. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means one. I need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. A little All more. Right. It's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now you I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the there. chili to go yeah, in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it. Yeah. I want that You're chili. Chintz out on that chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier oh, for you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right? Exactly. And a mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready? They are nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo! Good job, Al. Hey now. Life changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. 
What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there, and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries, just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery, and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid-80s. This summer, we're going to be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family, family employees, that's for John. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family-owned business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. 
it's like a second family to me. We all work together. We, you know, we get down in the dirt. You know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits, and we learn from each other, and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating ponies, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Pony dogs go. That's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth, just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool county spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan coney spot in the coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife Shelly, along with their daughter Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were going to open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, 
Um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior, to reflect like my basement or my living room where you can come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with this food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tasted so similar to it would as a, a regular Pony Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? For this chili? is Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough, yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed 
to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dookie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eater is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dookie Chase's. And I'm Edgar Dookie Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dookie Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace but that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, the list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that 
until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dukey. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. Gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family, all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family. and It's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We are enjoying everything. everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase to get myself some gumbo. When the service is right, they treat you nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together.
A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche williams Forson, The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open, nothing was open, you know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. It's, it's so, so good, good to see, to see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, Sylvia used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gentle he's putting it in there? Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Ah. Yeah. Wow. Like I feel her. I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. This now you're is a thigh person. This is, yeah, I, I know a thigh person. For. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning is moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists UEP Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come to the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders.